You'll notice on the board uh, behind me that we're opening a new book of study out of the book of Philippians. Uh, it will be a rich book for your life. I would encourage you, once you start with it, stay with it. Uh, it'll, it's only four chapters and 100, uh, 104 verses. So you ought to be able to read that little book each week uh, and uh, be prepared to. It is a phenomenal book, and I think it's the right book for our church at this time. I give him a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is the church age. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised on the, from the dead on the third day, the moment you believed, you received the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is a great teacher of the human soul, not only for Bible study, but for life principles. You can't study the Bible, nor can you live it out of your life in the flesh. It can only be done through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, successfully in the plan of God. How do I know if I'm in carnality or flesh? Personal sin, evidence of personal sin, mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. They should be confessed in silence and privacy through your priesthood before you start Bible study. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. You need to do that before we begin. And so our Father, we're thankful today. We live Zoe before you, Father. And this is the season for spider bites. It's not uncommon. But the treatment is really important. And the speed of it. And so we pray for that. We pray for the family. As uh, uh, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. That's my prayer for the family. It's my prayer for Zoe. It's my prayer. We also pray, Father, for the broadheads who are, who are in conference on missions in Nashville. Uh, this is designed to take believers who, who are passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ and establishing believers in the word of God through spiritual growth maturity from babies to immature to mature. It's a training field and an opportunity to overlook and see where maybe you might want to attend. And they'll bring a great report back to us about the mission field opportunities. We pray, Father, according to Matthew, the 28th chapter, 18 through 20, we are to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. It is our desire not only to be a church of Moody, but a church of the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll open your book to the book of Philippians, your Bible. Sometimes you miss that little book because it's just about a page, uh, two pages. Now I got one. Depends on how you look at Well, I, I don't know how we miss that, but sometimes we miss that little book uh, set in there by Ephesians and Colossians. When you read the book of Philippians, it's interesting how Paul opens up in the book of Philippians. Let me read just a few uh, passages. Uh, Paul writes, I, I put on your paper the first eight verses. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, they were the, they along with Silas were part of the mission team. Uh, that brought salvation to, the, to Philippi, established a group of believers, and founded a church with a pastor called, and ordained a man called Epaphroditus. He, he is writing to the, notice the three, three groups that, of the church he's writing to in Philippi. He's writing to saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including overseers and deacons. That's pretty much what a church consists of. Uh, the congregation of saints, the leadership of overseers, pastor, teachers, and deacons. He says, grace to you and peace. This is a, a typical salutation that Paul gives 
in all four of the prison epistles. Paul is writing from prison. He wrote four letters from prison that made it into the scriptures. And this is one of the four. His salutation is always the same. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we move along in the study, I'm going to come back and talk to you about what it means to be the peace from God. What is interesting in the Bible, there are different ideas established about peace. The peace of God. It can be the peace of God. It can be the peace from God. It can be the peace with God. And it all has different ideas about it. It's still peace, but it has different ideas about it. And we'll come back and do a study on that later. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In verse 3, he's now beginning to open the letter that he's writing. Remember, this, this was a letter. It was, it's called an epistle. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. If there's one thing you learn about Paul when you, when you read his writing, he was a man of great prayer. I don't know that you'll ever become great in the kingdom without a great prayer life. Anybody you will ever read about that's worth reading were men who always had a great prayer life. Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Pause for a moment with me. I know you have a prayer life, and I know you pray. Do you ever pray for the joy for other people's life? Isn't that interesting? Listen to what he said. Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. You know, I think, personally as a pastor, if we began to pray for people's life, offering joy for their life, we could eliminate anxiety in a moment. We could, we could eliminate, because joy is certainly the antidote to anxiety. You can't have both those things in your heart at the same time. And so I find that interesting because they are having some troubles in the church, as all churches do. He says, I'm offering, I'm offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel, from the first day, that's when he came in and we started preaching the gospel, they got converted, he started Bible studies, that Bible studies turned into churches, and the churches are now heavily engaged in mission programs. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. How could you not have confidence in your salvation? Why don't you have confidence in your salvation? As the, week, as the days, weeks go along, we'll talk about that. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, complete it, until the day of Christ. From the point of your salvation, God is responsible for your life all the way until you die or go to heaven. Do you understand that? Well, I'll read it again because you missed it. I am confident, Paul wrote, of this very thing. Now he's putting his finger on a point of doctrine. That he, God, who began a good work in you, salvation from the first day until now, right? Which he's talked about. Will perfect it. That word means complete it or finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is at work in your life based on your salvation from the day you get saved until the day you go to be with the Lord. God is in charge of that. Don't forget that. And listen, you won't have confidence and other people won't have confidence until you have confidence in that. And he is confident that they know because he's taught them about that. And people will try to tell you one day you got it, next day you haven't. You know how you got it the first day? You know how you got your salvation the first day? From God. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. It is a gift of God's grace. And the one who started that work in your life is responsible to keep that work going until the day you meet him face to face, one way or the other. Either you die and go be with him, or he comes to get you to be face to face with him. You need to have, see the key word is confidence. Are you confident about it? Stay with me a year. Stay with me a year. Stay with me a year. If you pick a day to study with me, if it's Sunday, stick with me all the way through it. Verse 7, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. That started in verse 3. What he said from 3 through 7, up to 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. Watch this now, because I have you in my heart. Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment, he's in jail, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of the grace of God with me. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you're a partaker with the rest of us who believe that. You're partaking in that. Then he, he closes this little section out for, God is my witness, how I long for you with the affections of Christ Jesus. That's a pretty powerful idea. That's a pretty powerful idea. He used the word affection. Now, normally, he, he would say uh, love. He didn't say love. He said affections. Affection is a side effect of love. It's the emotional side of it. Well, we'll talk about it. Notice I put that in the very top of your paper. When you read the book of Philippians, Paul is writing from a heart filled with affections toward the young church at Philippi. He wrote, for God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affections of Christ Jesus. I put two Greek words in there for you. These two Greek words are really important to understand what Paul is saying. Now, Paul might say, I love you like Christ loved the church when he died for it. And he's put you in a whole different category than what he's saying here. He used the word affection. He used the word affection. Not only that, but he used the word long. How I long for you all with the affections. Notice I gave you the Greek word epi Potheo, I gave you that word. You know what he's talking about? He has missed them and their fellowship that he had with them while he was in their midst when he left them and had to go on to other mission work. He has really missed them. That's what he's saying. I have really... How, look, he put the word a long absence from you has stirred my affections for you. I, I, I had such a good time with you in the Lord. I got to know you so well and your interest in Christ and his work. We become of the same mind and the same heartbeat in Christ, and I miss that. I miss the fellowship with you. Our conversations in Christ, our study of the Bible together, the things that un un uh, unified us. He said, I miss that. Listen, that's what you should miss about church. But you got to be a participant in it in order to know what you've missed. How do you know what you've missed if you've never 
been part of something. Now let me encourage you not just to attend a church, but to become a participant in the church. You are, you are, you are the church. You don't go to church, you are the church that goes. You are the church. You are the church. You don't go to church, you are the church. Wherever you are, that's where the church is. So he says, how, how I long for you with affections. And splachna is an interesting word because it's a word that deals with the Greek idea. It was the emotions that were deep in you that came from heartfelt feelings. Splachna. And that's the word he use, uses for affections. That I, I love you from the depth of my heart kind of business. I'm going to always love you. I love you. I love you in this way. I will always love you. Because we belong to Christ who loves us extremely. And so this is kind of interesting for all. And he writes this little book out of this great heart of love. His heart is filled with love for these people. And he's showing it by his words, is he not? He's using emotional words about how he feels deep down in him about this group of people. That's a wonderful thing, my church. That is a wonderful thing. This book only is four chapters and 104 verses. So this is not a long read. It will be a long study. <laughs> but it's not a long read. So let me talk about a few things before we break uh, for coffee and some donuts. The book of Philippians is one of four prison epistles written by Paul. This is important for you to know. Philippians, it, this is Amplified Bible in their footnotes. They wrote, a, they wrote an interesting piece that I'm quoting. Philippians is classified as the fourth of Paul's prison letters or epistles written shortly after Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. That's your four prison epistles. Probably written around 61 AD, during fall, Paul's first imprisonment in Rome between 59 and 61. That, they're right on the money on it. And that's the reason I quoted him. What had happened is Paul is under house arrest. You can read about it in Acts 28, 11 through 31, and it's worth your read. He was living and ministering out of a rental house under guard as a Roman citizen. Paul was a dual citizen. As a Roman citizen for two years in Rome. You can read about that specifically in Acts 28, 30 and 31. You can read about it in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 1. And the 6th chapter, verse 20, where we're told in the book of Ephesians, written at the same approximate time, that he was an ambassador for Christ in chains. Now, I can't tell you how important that idea is, an ambassador for Christ in chains. As a Roman citizen, they didn't have enough to put him in a prison at this point, you know, he started out in prison, then he wound up in a house. Well, are you familiar with the Philippian jailer? What must I do to be saved? Huh? Then you got an idea. He was an ambassador in chains. Look at it. <laughs> He went to prison under house arrest. He was taken out of prison, put under house arrest for two years. He's considered by Rome as a prisoner. He's, he's guarded every day of his life. Can't go out, can't, can't go in. He's, in he's, he's locked up. Did he ever consider himself a prisoner? What did he consider himself? How did he think he, who did he think he was in prison? An ambassador for Christ. 
You know why? Because he was put in prison because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He never one day thought he was a prisoner. Not one day. Isn't that interesting? But every day of his life, whether in prison or out of prison, he was a what? An ambassador for Christ. Do you know that you are and I am too? We're an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador for Christ. You should remember who you are. You're a lot of things in Christ. You know that little pamphlet, 50 things? You should pick one up and read it because there's 20 status privileges of who you are in Christ. You ought to know all 20 because that's who other people are looking for out of your life. They're looking for Christ and they don't know it's Christ until you show, like some, listen, he's an ambassador. <laughs> he's, and listen, you think this man as an ambassador is not going to have an impact? Listen, you're going to read in the book of Philippians that the Pridor, the, the Pridorian guard of Rome, which is, is the elite, that's like having Navy SEALs guard you. He won him to Christ. You know why? He never considered himself a what? But always considered himself what? An ambassador for Christ. <laughs> Wherever you stuck Paul, he never considered himself what you stuck him on. His title, he never let you put a title on him that wasn't a title he had, he had put on himself. You're not going to call Paul a sinner. Because Christ took that title away from him. Christ came into the world to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I was the chief. Don't call me a sinner any longer. I'm not a sinner any longer. I've been saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't call me a sinner. Call me a saint. But don't call me a sinner. Isn't that wonderful? This man was an ambassador for Christ. He never let people define who they were in Christ. You must not let the world define who you are in Christ. Don't let him put a title on you that's not true in Christ. Who you are, you need to study those 20 status privileges in that little pamphlet. We probably got some back there. I don't know. They go like hotcakes, so I don't know. But you need, you need to know who you are to become that person. Right? I mean, you can't be a football player and show up with a basketball and can dunk it. That's not going to impress the football coach. you got to know who you are in the game of life. Who are you now that you've been saved? Who are you is who you should be. Don't be somebody you're not. Be who you are in Christ. And so as the days go on, we'll talk about that stuff. I'm just introducing it to you. Notice Paul mentions the Bridorian guard. He won many to Christ. They come and guarded him, and all he did, he's an ambassador for Christ, right? So they meet the ambassador for Christ every day they come. They meet the ambassador for Christ who talks about Christ. They don't talk about prison. He don't talk about the food. He don't talk about the conditions. He talks about Jesus Christ. Listen, not only that, listen, in the fourth chapter, verse 22, he says, I send greetings from Caesar's household to you. That he's won the kitchen staff to Christ. They bring him food. They bring him food. He says, you know who that food's for, don't you? And they say, well, it says, the prisoner. He said, I'm not a prisoner. I'm an ambassador. <laughs> well, how can you be an ambassador? I was, I was told to go to cell block three. He said, well, since you asked, let me tell you. And leads him to Christ. Who are you today? When you go out into the public square, who are you? Who are you? If you know who you are in Christ, there's ministry in that identity. Paul was an ambassador for Christ. Everybody came into his place. They said, okay, you're prisoner one, two, three, cell block four, whatever. 
And he went, well, you must have the wrong place. <laughs> I'm the ambassador for Christ. What's your, what's your name? Well, it's Paul. Well, that's what it says here. Hey, but I'm no prisoner. I'm an ambassador. <laughs> Don't you know it drove them crazy for a while? Until they got saved. Then they went like, oh, wow. I'm an ambassador too, and then Paul. He went, yep. Yeah, you're an ambassador too. Isn't that good? Yeah, it is. The second is, who, who did Paul write to? Who is this letter written to? Well, he tells you. He says to three groups, I write this to three groups, and I want the three groups to pay attention to when their group is mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I'm writing to the saints. That's a congregation. I'm writing to the overseers. That's the men in ministry. And I'm writing to the deacons. That's the people who are responsible for the duties of the church. And when I'm talking about, when I'm talking to you in this group, take it serious, right? Take it all serious. But, what, but what, I'm going to get to you. But I'm writing to these three groups. Now, the church is one made up of three divisions right here. So he's talking about the congregation. and He's talking about the leadership, isn't he? He said this leadership, this letter is not only for the congregation, but it's for the leadership of the church. So the leadership of our church should pay attention to it as well as your pastor. So he writes to the saints in Christ Jesus. We, you know, we all are. The moment you got saved, one of the status, 20 status privileges of your life is you, you are a saint. And you're, you're an hagios. You're holy. That's, the word saint comes from the Greek word holy, like the, a holy God, a holy Jesus, and a holy, holy spirit. A ho holy spirit. The holy Bible. Ho holy, 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 right? The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you become part of the holiness of God. You're called a saint because you're holy. Not because you, you, you deserve it, because it's a grace gift. Positionally. Now, experientially, it's a different point. But, ex but positionally, you're a saint. They call you a saint. It means you are holy as part of God. As part of God's family, you are holy. And so he call they call it in the Greek language, they call it a saint. A saint in Christ Jesus. These are the members of the church body based on positional sanctification. Listen, the church needs to understand pos positional sanctification. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ. In the Greek language, that's in, E-N, plus the locative of a sphere or a place. If any man be in Christ, right, that's positional sanctification. And, and, and we know that from second, I wrote these on your paper, in second Thessalonians, the second chapter, 13 to 14, Paul writes that you have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit and by faith in the truth. You know what that, you know what faith in the truth is? It's the gospel. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, they died for your sins, were buried and raised from the dead. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says that's the gospel. That Christ died. Listen, he's got to cover Adam's sin, which is the sin death. Wherefore is by one man Adam sent into the world to death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. You understand? Because we're all, we have, that's the human race. They're dead in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. If you're dead in Adam, right, you're spiritually dead. You're separated from God in time. If you put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're in Christ and you're spiritually alive in time and eternity. Am I, am I? You ought to read also on your own, Romans 15, 16, who's going to tell you the same thing. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Justification comes through the blood of Christ, the gospel. Sanctification comes by the other member of the Godhead, God the Son gives you justification because of the justice of God. Do you understand? Listen, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that brings justification to your life. Takes away your judgment. He died on the cross for you, for your judgment. For your sin, death, judgment. 
The Holy Spirit at that moment comes into your life and places you into Christ, baptizes you into Christ. A position that's locked. Because it's in where? It's in Christ. If any man be in Christ, in Christ, how do I get in Christ? Through the gospel, I get into Christ. If I get into Christ, that position is locked. It's called positional sanctification. My, 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 don't let anybody steal your salvation from you. My, 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 don't let them do that. Don't let them do that stuff. Then we have another group, the overseers, who are the trained, ordained pastor teachers associated with the church. You can read about it in Acts 20, 17, 28. First Timothy, where the ordinational qualifications are. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7, or Titus 1, 5 through 9. Or deacons. These were the spiritual mature men of the church, uh, selected by the congregation, ordained by the, by the, the ministers, and uh, have administrative duty of the ministry of the local church. Well, yeah, look. You can read about it in 1 Timothy 3. Listen, I don't give you anything I state without Scripture to back it. You're not going to walk out here and say, well, Ron Adamus said, look, at, I give you Scripture. I don't have time to read it all. You've got to do a little bit on your own. But you, you need to read this stuff. Point number three. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas were the two guys that went out on the second missionary trip. Later in that trip, you're going to see that Timothy joined him uh, to do the follow-up and to, to develop the church. Paul and Silas founded the church at Philippi on Paul's second missionary trip. You can probably the most famous passage is Acts 16. Uh, and what's interesting is that first that second missionary trip is going to follow the Jerusalem Church Conference in Acts 15. That church conference was a big deal because it separated the law from grace theologically separated the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. Well, well, well. The, if you want to read the second missionary trip, and it's well worth your read, you read Acts 15, 36, through the 18th chapter, verse 22, you can read the whole, the whole count. Philippi was not the only church converted, was not the only church established on that trip. That second trip was dynamite. One of the things that made it so interesting was when they got to Troas in Asia Minor, Paul was not sure whether he should go north, south, or what. And so he, the, the team paused and they had prayer. Do you want us to go up towards the Black Sea or you want us to go north? Where do you want us to go? And it's called the Macedonian call. The Macedonian call. In the Macedonian call, God said to Paul, go westward. And it changed his ministry forever. Paul only went westward. As far as we know, he went all the way to Spain. Well, a true as Paul's received the Macedonian call to evangelize westward. You can read about it in Acts 16, 9 through 13. Through 13 and Philippians 1, 1 and 5, the Macedonian call extended to, listen to me, to European Christianity. I'm going to let that sink a minute because you didn't get it. When he told them to go westward, Paul understood that, that he was to take that all the way to Spain. Paul, Paul mentions that. All the way to Spain. When you get to Spain, you're in, the, you're in the European mission field. Why is that important to you sitting here today? Because out of it, listen, out of the European mission field came what? What happened that's so important to Western civilization? You know a guy called Luther? The Reformation. 
we're in the first century when the gospel hit Europe. By the 17th century, 18th century, the gospel was still going westward to America. And here we sat. You think this call to go westward wasn't important in the great scheme of the plan of God? We sat here today out of the Macedonian call. That's amazing. Is that not amazing? And here we are, the church at the uttermost parts of the earth. We send all of our missionaries back east. At least all that go from here, they do. Well, you should read Romans 15, 24 if you want to know about Spain. And you should. On this trip of the second missionary trip, it was during this trip that Timothy joined the Pauline team. While the Philippian church was meeting, and a wonderful lady, the, we call her the first convert of Europe because of the Macedonian call, Lydia. Oh, that's a wonderful read. You should read about Lydia. She held church in her home. And Timothy came in and worked from there. And out of that developed this whole church. And they, put, and they funded Paul to go westward to Spain. And we sat here today as compliments of God's marvelous grace. My, my, my people. I mean, I don't know how much we understand all the connections that God has. But we're, we're pretty fortunate, aren't we? Point number four, the pastor teacher of the, of the Philippian church was a guy called named Epaphroditus. He became the carrier of Paul's letters back and forth to the churches, especially the church at Philippi. He, he, he was the mailman for Paul of the word of God. In Philippians 2, 25 through 30, and the fourth chapter, 15 through 19, we're told that Paul called him my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, my minister, who met my needs. A minister who met my needs. He was very close to Paul, and Paul loved him dearly, and he was a phenomenal pastor. He was the one who carried the doctrinal message out of the book of Philippians to this marvelous little church. The doctrines between Paul and the church. He would go out, he'd get them from Paul. Paul would explain them. He'd go back and teach them. <laughs> That's the way it still works. Point number five, Paul bragged on this little Philippian church for their faithful support of missionary evangelism, especially his. He wrote, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that in the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia headed westward, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Do you know it's difficult for the church to understand is giving and receiving. When you support other people's ministry, there's two things that occur to it by the grace of God. On the one hand, there is the person who receives it that goes like, oh, it... The person who receives it knows that only God could have given it to him because there was no other way it was getting to him. His ministry was on a bubble. I don't have enough gas to get to work or back, right? I don't have enough gas to get to there and there back. But I know who has all the gas in the world. So I'm going to sit here until I get it, and then I'll move forward. See, there's a, a receiving side 
to the gifts that we give our missionaries. There's a receiving side, and I promise you, there are wonderful stories about when they got it and why they got it and what, impo how, what importance it had in moving their ministry forward. So there's a, there's a receiving side and then there's a giving side where you just feel led by God to get engaged in a ministry and you give in a way that you would never imagine yourself giving that kind of money to anything else but that. And you know that you've been touched by God to do it. When God is able to touch two sides of this funding, some wonderful things happen in the kingdom about grace. Nothing promotes grace greater than people who understand it and are obedient to it. There's a giving side to it that you may never see, and there's a receiving side to it that you may never see, but God does. And I want you to know it always impacts the moment. I can't tell you how many times I talk to missionaries or ministers in the field who talk about that very thing. How God showed up in a last second and made every provision possible. And the person knew God would do it. The person knew that God would do it. Sometimes you're on the receiving end and sometimes you're on the giving. But let me tell you, both sides are important. And Paul said, I understand both sides to this funding. You know, we say we fund our missionaries. We fund our ministries. I just said we send our kids to camp. We think this week is important to their life. We send them to camp. If you got a child from the third grade to the eighth grade, you ought to send them to camp. A camp will change their life. Because it's about Christ. Christ is a life changer. What's for me, was for you. Christ changed my life. I mean, it changed my life dramatically. So, we're a mission church giving to missions. We ourselves are a mission church out here. We're two years old out here. We're 49 years old, but we're two years old out here. Point number six. You want to pay a special attention to the word gospel in the English. I wrote them down here. This book is filled with the word gospel. Chapter, in the first chapter, it's in verse 3, talking about participation in the gospel. Verse 7, confirmation of the gospel. Verse 12, the greater progress of the gospel. Verse 27, worthy of the gospel. Second chapter, verse 22, the furtherance of the gospel. Chapter 4, verse 1, the cause of the gospel. Chapter 15, preaching the gospel. This little book is filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the key word that dominates the book. The only chapter that's not in, the word gospel is not in it with great purpose, is chapter 3. Wouldn't chapter 3 be interesting to read? Do you know why Paul didn't mention it? Because he mentioned it everywhere else. Well, when we get there, uh, many moons from now, we'll actually talk about it. The book of Philippians is one of the greater books of the Bible to teach on missionary evangelism. I haven't been doing this much anymore because I'm dedicated to getting this, this church on his feet. But I used to spend a lot of time doing missionary conferences on, on this out of the book of Philippians, out of chapter 1. But Paul gave me the outline to preach it. And I used to go all over the United States and holding and held uh, missionary conferences, trying to get people to understand you start be, by being a missionary in your neighborhood, in your family, uh, in your community, and then when you get 
confident about that and what God is trying to do, then wait for God to, to send you all kinds of places. I mean, who would have ever thought? I mean, I hear missionaries that are our, our, our missionaries on a foreign field. They, they, it's just, they were amazed that God had called them to the mission field. They went out there to give it a whirl, you know, to give it a try. The first thing you know, they're, they're, they were there. I mean, there was no way, no other place they wanted to be but right there in that mission field. Like a young couple that came out of our church that's in the Philippines. And, you know, you know the stories as well as I do about all this. But listen, where are you in all this? <laughs> we should always be an ambassador for Christ, shouldn't we? We should all be involved, always involved in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is what brought us into the kingdom. It's what brings other people in it. When's the last time you brought somebody into the kingdom? When's the last time you talked about coming into the kingdom? Well, don't you think that would be a good idea? It takes nothing to explain. I take a napkin and I write the, the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. They ask, what is that? And I tell them. I said, have you ever seen this before? I turn around and look at it. They go, well, what is that? They ask, what is that? Well, Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and raised from the dead the third day. If you believe it, you get saved. Let me talk about that. I've never had anybody not want to talk about it. I don't believe it. I believe that all these encounters are by divine design. That's what I believe. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take an offering. This, this meal has been paid for, so if you're a visitor, why, feel comfortable. Just sit there. As This is the way we take our offerings here in this congregation. Okay? Let's pray. Well, our Father, we're thankful. Paul wrote the book of Philippians, and we're going to study it. We're going to take this thing apart and look at it, Father, and see how it, how it reflects in the life of our church. We, we want to be that church. We want to be Grace Valley Bible Church that's mission-oriented, that support missionaries out on the field, that train young men to go as far as God would send them. I, Paul had no idea when he stopped at Troas. He wondered, should I go to the right, the left? I know I'm at a... I'm at a crossroads here. I've got several ways I can go. What way should I go, Father? And he goes like, go westward, son. Always go westward. What a wonderful thing it is, Father. That's how I got to Moody. It's exactly how I got to Moody. And I'm so thankful for it. I pray today, Father, as we give, we understand there's a giving side and a receiving side. And for us, we give this, Father, with a grace attitude and pray that it be received in the same way for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.